Hi guys, welcome back. Matt Barton here. Uh, this is Matt Chat episode 426, featuring part two of my interview with the fabulous Trent Oster, the CEO of Beamdog, formerly of Bioware. In this segment, we're talking about game engines, multiplayer functionality, how that works in Neverwinter Nights, what's, what's good about the way Neverwinter Nights handles that. Uh, then we get into Trent's early work, including the Blasteroids 3D, which I actually tracked down and has some footage of it here for you. As well as, of course, uh, Shattered Steel, a really awesome game that uh, Trent feels didn't ever get the love it really deserved. So hopefully we can rectify that uh, today. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Trent Oster. I remember when I talked way back when I talked to John Romero about, uh, not Doom, it must have been Wolfenstein, uh, Wolfenstein okay. 3D. And he was saying, yeah, we were going to make an art, basically, uh, they wanted to take all the stuff from that original stealth game and put it in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty early on, he's like, no, <laughs> this is going to make it way too... I think he said it would slow everything down too oh, much. Yeah. They wanted the speed, but I'm pretty sure it was uh, a lot to do with... Do we really want to tack another year or two onto the... <laughs> we already got a fun yeah, game. <laughs> I think when you look at a, a video game engine, what makes an engine fast isn't what it does, it's what it doesn't do. So, so mm -hmm. like, the, the early renderers... Uh, the, the Quake renderer uses BSP tree. And the BSP tree, the way I look at it is everything, every decision is 50%. So you're like, 50% of the world, I don't have to draw because it's behind me. Boom, 50%, it's over on this side, I don't have to deal with that. 50% over here, don't have to deal with that. Every decision is an optimization and allows the game engine to be that much faster. So when you do an RPG, you're like, oh, well, what about flying? Oh, shit. <laughs> what about teleportation? Oh, shit. What about swimming? Oh, shit. <laughs> it just keeps piling up. There's so much work you could do, so you kind of constrain the problem down. It's like, okay, no flying, no swimming, no teleporting. Let's just keep it simple. Okay, maybe teleporting will sneak back in late, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the flying. and was it, my Magic 6? You play that one where you can get this fly spell. I remember the first time I was just like, wow, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess it wouldn't really work too well. I don't know how you'd, how would you do that in a isometric? Game? <sighs> you'd, you'd have to cheat. You'd have to basically make either no fly zones or you'd have to block off the roof of almost everything. Because it's so easy to, oh, I'll go to the start of the module. I'll fly up. I'll look to where the end end boss is. I'll fly over there. I'll land and I'll yeah. fight the end boss. And hey, seven minutes in, I'm I'm done the module. Yeah, I wonder if that's why World of Warcraft, when they come out with a new a new area, they'll make it so you can't fly. <laughs> Probably just to keep the content kind of gated. Because yeah. when I originally thought about Neverwinter and and how fast people were going to be able to go through the game, I was really concerned by that. I'm like. The game could launch, and within a week, everybody could be like level twenty running around. What are we? What are we going to do about that? And the answer is, well, people want to play with their friends, and and just let them level, adapt essentially to what their friends are playing. And so when we built Neverwinter characters, they were kind of like layers on an onion. So there was your first level character kind of at the core of that, and every time you added a layer, it was a level, and you just kept growing out. So if if you were seventh level and I was tenth level and you started a 7th level campaign, I could join your campaign and it would just chuck my character down to that 7th level version and I could essentially branch at that point and, and continue my development. It was, uh, I mean, in, That's a good in way retrospect, it. it was a reasonably elegant solution. It was a little confusing because you'd wind up with like four, ver four versions of your character that could all be the same level but could be radically different builds, but because each character lived in the server that they were playing on, if you configured it that way, it seemed to make a little more sense. Yeah, I've started many. I haven't finished one yet. But <laughs> I play my, yeah, I play my with my wife. We we're just talking about this. She's like, Who, "Who's the guy you're interviewing?" Well, you know, tell him about telling her about you. She's like, "Well, didn't we play Neverwinter?" <laughs> yeah, we played through the whole <laughs> thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I know who, who that is. But yeah, we, it's a lot of fun to co-op. Yeah. Uh, those games, of course, that was uh, we were in the same room together. I don't. It was. A, I've tried a few online. Yeah, it was actually surprising to us how many couples played Neverwinter together, two computers in the same room playing together and just having a ton of fun with it. Mm -hmm. And that was that was oh, one yeah, of was the ideas of we kind of love was the idea of of a group of friends pulling their PCs together, having a LAN party, and just playing together. 
It's not really when you put it that way. It's not all that different than gathering around a tabletop. Yeah, it's it's just a lot more weight to pack around. <laughs> <laughs> Books are a little lighter. Well, let's get into the, your uh, early days. I wanted to touch on some of your your personal history, as <laughs> as it as it were. Okay. Uh, so I saw you went to the uh, you studied computer science at the University of Saskatchewan. Who apparently they had the same team as uh, we do the huskies yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool here at st cloud state it's also huskies i was just wondering did you always uh, want to do computer games did you have other other goals at the time uh, computer games was never plan a no never plan, plan a, a was like in high school i sat down with a guidance counselor we picked out a systems analyst because it sounded like a good job i was pretty good with computer systems yeah, I was analyst. pretty good with computery stuff so i was like i'll be a systems analyst but i also really like vehicles and working on them so i was like maybe i should be a mechanic instead mechanic could be fun i get to work on cars all the time so i took a year and i worked as an apprentice mechanic and i decided that there was kind of two kinds of jobs in the world those you wash your hands before you go to the bathroom and those you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom mechanic definitely wash your hands wow. before you go to the bathroom so in the end i was like yeah mechanics fun but you know i want to do the computer stuff so I, w I went to a local college got my first year of university transfer comp sci then i transferred to university of saskatchewan and uh, i finished my third year and i was actually really interested in computer hardware design i thought it was amazing hmm. i just really liked the idea of of how elegant and simple the actual hardware itself was and and how abstract code had already become like this is we were mainly pascal for the early years and then we grew into c later and, and a little bit of c plus plus and then uh in the summer of my third year we we got together myself my brother and a high school friend marcel zeschuk his parents had a building and we did a computer consulting by day and video game dev by night and uh, we started building a game that became Blastroids 3D. Blastroids we 3D. A, <laughs> we made an agreement that okay, if by the end of summer we can actually build a video game, we're going to go for it. We're going to make we're going to make the big game. We didn't know what the big game was, but we knew we were going to make the big game. So over the course of the summer, we we, we built Blastroids 3D, and we learned a lot. Uh, I tried to build a sound engine from scratch. I learned how complicated sound on the PC was at that time. Oh, did you do the music for nope. that game? Uh, what was the story with the music on that? I'm trying to remember what the... I don't remember what we did for the music. I think there might have been like a, a MIDI program that would like auto-generate tracks, and I just kept pressing the rando auto-generate, wow. and then we got one that was like, hey, that's not bad. Let's just run with it. Yeah, I thought it was yeah, pretty the, good. The sound engine itself was like... Okay, I'm gonna build one. Okay, what do I need to do? Oh, okay, I gotta get a, I gotta get a wave file from memory in the computer, over to the piece, the sound card. Okay, how do I do that? And this is 16-bit DOS, so it turns out it's like there's a 20-bit DMA address you have to feed, and then you have to start pushing it through, and you can do these little buffers for it. And within about a month and a half of utter hell. All I had was the sound card would make a horrid shriek at me, and, and then I would have to figure out how to stop it. And then at that time, we learned about uh, licensing middleware. We found a, <laughs> we found a, oh, so at least that was an option at that there point. Was, uh, there was a couple options at that point, and uh, we, we wound up licensing one of them. It was pretty cheap. And it actually played sounds as opposed to shrieking at you. So we integrated that sound engine, and uh, I did the controller input. I did uh, some of the some of the graphics for it. I did uh, the the cockpit graphics, the 2D using Corel Photo Paint 3.0, which is not not oh. a fine art tool at all. But it's what we had. And uh, at the end of the summer, we had a game that. Uh, it ran in 16-bit DOS. It took up about 618k of the 640k you had. So, hopefully, you were really good at high miming your mouse drivers and all the stuff that you had to do way back then. And uh, we shipped it out shareware, and we made absolutely zero dollars on it. 
Oh, I was wondering that. Yeah, uh, it eventually got bundled into a bundle, but we never saw any cash out of the bundle either. The the guys who bundled it, I think they went out of business pretty quick after that. So I think it was called the GameWorks bundle. I have a box from it. It's it's kind of hilarious. Oh. Yeah, I was. Uh, I think we were talking before the the interview. I was able to find it. <laughs> One of these massive uh, DOS tours. It took me a while because I guess there's a couple of different Blasteroids. We weren't really original uh, games with that. The title. We weren't really original with the naming. I'll give you that. <laughs> Finite element software, but I was I was able to get it to basically yeah. to run in DOS box. But you know what I was thinking I would do is uh, I'll just post a link to it in the show notes, and somebody else that's better at DOS box can figure out how to get this thing to <laughs> run smoothly. With crowdsource getting <laughs> Blastroids 3D yeah, up and running again. Because uh, it looks pretty it looks pretty awesome. It's not. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that bad. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what I would call a, a sound first effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 3D. Yeah, at the, it's at the time, there was... What was the shareware thing? I didn't even look at that part of it. Was it if you like the game, send in some yeah. money or yeah? Levels? It was. Uh, it, it had a, a number of levels with the demo, and if you like the game, send in a send in some dollars, and we'll unlock it for you. And uh, so it's basically like the, the Doom and Wolfenstein yeah, model. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I think it got cracked really quickly because we didn't exactly <laughs> hide that very well. <laughs> it was literally like a parameter got set, and nobody bought it. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that seems kind of cheesy to crack a shareware game. Oh. Check, check me out. I cracked the shareware yeah, game. But... Deprive these, like, <laughs> a couple of dudes yeah. of their, of their yeah, income. Well, wow. it, let us, like, it, it kind of prepared us for the rest of our career. So we went the whole summer without making any money from the game stuff. So we were doing a bit of computer consulting. And then once we started on the big game, we just didn't pay ourselves for like a year and a half. It's like, we'll just live off our parents. <laughs> I was living off my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> and uh, oh. that's that was, that's how we, we got started on Shattered Steel. Yeah, Shattered Steel is perfect perfect timing on this. I wanted to, had to get into this. So if I got my dates right here, this was 1996. Does that sound about that right? That was... Uh, and we started on Shattered Steel before we even shipped Blasteroids. So this was many, or at least two or three years yep. of development. Yeah, it's about uh, two and a half years, I think. So I, I was looking at your tweets, tweet stream. Is that what you call I, that? Your I, Twitters, I <laughs> not tweets. <laughs> and I found one about Shattered Steel. I thought I would. Uh, I thought this would be a good segue into sure. this. So you say, this is you quoting. Nobody gives Shattered Steel the love it deserves. We had co-op multiplayer missions. We had destructible terrain. We had competitive head-to-head -head missions. All in 1997. It was. It was actually. What the heck? So nobody's. You're not getting enough respect for Shattered Steel. What's I, going I on? It just there? didn't get. It didn't get the love that it, I think it could have. It could have benefited from back in the day when it launched. It launched almost head-to-head -head with MechWarrior Mercenaries. Uh, and it's, it's mercenaries is the 800 pound gorilla in the giant walking robot space so kind of got crushed on that marketing side but shatter steel was doing these fun gameplay things like we were playing competitive missions in the office where one team had to protect a convoy and the other team had to attack it and they were just a ton of fun it was it was crazy stuff for the era and uh, unfortunately i guess a lot of people never saw that well, that's a shame i guess it's gotten a little better, better well known today. I mean, I hear people talk about it. We we did some things right. Ask him about Shattered Steel. You know, I got a couple of those. We did some things right. There were some things on, about Shattered Steel that I really liked. I really liked the the weapons. They were up. They were in your face. It felt very very visceral. When there was machine guns rotating, they were firing. When the plasma guns were firing, it was a lot of fun. Uh, having rockets tracking through the sky was was a ton ton of fun, and. Uh, the multiplayer and, and having having the nuke in there, like you could launch a nuclear missile and it would hit and it would deform the terrain. So the terrain would kind of ripple and then fall down a bit and darken. So it was at the end of a multiplayer game, basically, you're running around and the entire surface is black and flat <laughs> because you're down That's to awesome zero. Part. Yeah, we, uh, we actually found a really interesting thing that happens. So we were running around in the game and I had uh, I had somehow disabled the, the edges of the map. 
So I ran off the map. I'm kind of running into random memory because it, it literally was just looking at a height field. So I'm looking at random memory and suddenly I'm like, I think I'm in the textures because I could spot kind of the patterns of the textures. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to keep running. And then I saw spikes that were kind of spiking up and then falling down in the train. And I'm like, I think that's DOS. <laughs> I'm a little worried. Ah, hell. Shoot a shoot a nuke at this it. Is... See what happens. Boop. Computer. <laughs> and then your computer just crashed. <laughs> and I was like, that was DOS. Yep. Oh. Let's uh, let's let's reboot and start over here. Well, that sounds like some some scene from yeah, Tron. Yeah. So the moral of the story is don't nuke DOS. It's just, <laughs> just not happy. <laughs> now, so let's see. With Shattered Steel, you worked on it for a while. Had you been? Was this part of? Were you part of Bioware? And then you started working on it and left left Bioware. I'm kind of, sort of a little confused about how all this. It's 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 a confusing was... time. So we had pyrotech. Yeah, so we had finished uh, Blastroids 3D, and okay, so that was yeah, done. so that was the end of the summer, and we had started on what became Shattered Steel, and then Marcel's cousin Greg Zeschuk, who I I'd, I'd known since I was about ten, he used to come down the summer and visit. He came in and he saw what we were doing, and he's like, "This is awesome. I want to be part of this." So we started talking about it, and he had his his friends from medical school, Ray Musica and Augustine Yip, and they're like, yeah, we totally want to do something here. Why don't the six of us get together, we'll set up a company. So we agreed, yep, yeah, let's set up a company. And for about two months, we fought about names. It was, oh, God, naming things is so hard. <laughs> One yeah. of the leading candidates was... Oh. Has you ever seen Spinal Tap movie? <laughs> no, actually. Remember that part where they're all given these funny names? Well, then we were the originals, but we found out there was already an original, so we became the new originals. And <laughs> it's just... I, I think probably it's the same for you and game development. Oh, naming right? things is is so hard. It's just... Nothing sounds great when you hear it for the first time. And by the, by the time you said it 10,000 times, it sounds so just fine. So in the end, it doesn't matter. Once you settle on a name, yeah. you'll say it so many times, it'll sound right. And now that you mention it, I'm just like, thinking Bioware. You know, somebody just said, I want to name my company Bioware. I think, eh. Yeah, it would be... Would you like taking a bio, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Pyrotech. That sounds like fire. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was kind of our <laughs> angle on it. Is, uh, for, for Shattered Steel... We were trying to build like weapon effects that were really fun and really in your face. And this was before you could buy really good effects libraries and, and explosions and such. So we actually went out. We lived on a farm. And we went out a couple nights in a row. And we just tried different things to capture these visual effects for fire. So we just had a, a, a crappy little video camera. And we would aim it. And then we'd set off something and see how it looked. And the, the nuclear explosion <laughs> in the game is actually uh, engine oil that's been heated in the in a pipe, and it has a bit of a, a drop down in it, so uh, like a, a drain on a on a sink. And so we had a propane torch heating this oil till it's boiling and it's hot, and then we pumped compressed air in behind it, which shot all the oil up into the sky, and then the torch ignited it. So you get this big <laughs> fireball, and it rolled beautifully, and it had black smoke, and it, it looked really good. The problem at the time was the video camera staring out into darkness, and then all of a sudden the fireball goes off, and it's so bright it just washes out the camera. So you actually had to take a, a, a shop light and pre-blind the camera so that it mm. would capture the – so we could only use about – two-thirds of the screen to capture the thing because we needed a portion of it being blinded by the shop light. And then we, we got this visual effect and we went through, cut it up, edited it frame by frame, and finally got it into the game. And that's kind of why we named the company Pyrotech because it's like, hey, we, get, we, uh, we made our own visual effects by blowing stuff up and lighting it on fire. That's a memory, yeah. yeah. I just wonder, like, the, the neighbors think, you know, oh, it's a UFO sighting or... <laughs> What are these guys doing on the field? Yeah. I found one of the videos, actually, the the video of the, of the, I don't know if it was the actual nuke explosion we used, but it was one of them. And uh, I remember, like, we had about a 40-foot-long piece of pipe there, and it was so hot I could barely stand to look at it. I had to turn away when, it, when I blew the air into it because it threw so much heat. And that was... Uh, I assume you didn't have insurance people out there. <laughs> this, this was all experimentation. I think at the time we were, 
We were running sans worker compensation or any kind of insurance. So after Shattered Steel, you wanted to come back to Bioware, I guess. Or what happened there? Yeah, so partway through the development of Shattered Steel, there was some tension. My brother, a, he's a very driven guy, but he's very harsh on other people around him. Hmm. And he decided Marcel wasn't working hard enough. So he wanted Marcel gone. So Greg and, and Ray and everybody got together and they agreed, okay, we're going to get rid of Marcel. There'll be five of us. So they got rid of Marcel. Then a couple months passed. My brother's like, I don't like Og. Og's not working hard enough. And they're kind of like, uh, yeah, we actually like Og more than we like you. <laughs> so uh, See your older brother, Og. younger brother? Old, older older brother. brother. Okay. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a really smart guy. He's, he's very, very hardworking. But he's also, he can be really hard on people. So my brother and I actually broke off, and we set up Pyrotech Game Studios at that point. Mm -hmm. And we ran that for just about, a, it was about nine months where we were in another city. And we had, at that time, we had the deal with Interplay with Bioware to do Shattered Steel, the game. So we were doing it essentially as a sub-studio of Bioware, where we were a separate entity, but we were, we were fulfilling our, our obligations to give them essentially a finished game. And then uh, my brother one day decided that I wasn't working hard enough and that I should be oh, gone. No. So I was like, all right, let's talk about this. And uh, we got into a big argument. And it, eventually he went down and he took a job at uh, Origins working on the Gene Combat stuff because he was a really good graphics programmer, like one of the probably one of the better guys of that era. He, he could just understand what the hardware was trying to do what needed to be done on the hardware to get the visuals you wanted because uh, like shatter steel is a, a scan line rasterizer but it fixed some of the problems that a lot of different companies had run into where terrain would kind of swim around a bit mm -hmm. it was actually quite intelligent but uh, so he wound up doing that and i'm i'm down in this other city which is uh, calgary alberta i've got a studio i've just lost my lead programmer and i'm like hey Greg and Ray, let's uh, let's move it up to Edmonton. We'll finish the game there. We'll get it out. So I put in a bunch of work. At the time, I was working as a 3D artist on the project. I was building the enemies, building the, the mechs, building the user interface screens. I put that down for a while, went back to my programming hat, and hacked together enough to get us what Interplay approved as a beta. Got the payment for the beta, and we shut the office down. I gave people as much severance as I could and then moved everything up. And uh, we had a studio of like seven people at that point, mm. and just two of us moved up to Bioware. And then Bioware had a had just they'd been working on the Baldur's Gate concept, and they had hired essentially an entire team out of Grand Prairie. And one of their programmers was Cameron Topher, who's my business partner in Beamdog. So Cam came in and he joined the Shattered Steel team as kind of a junior programmer, and a local programmer, Dennis Papp, took over as kind of the lead on it. And uh, we, we slowly marched it to the finish. And that's all for, well, that's actually not all for this week's episode. I do have a bonus episode here for you, or an early episode anyway, uh, with David Craddock uh, talking about his book, Arcade Perfect. Uh, which just came out today, so I really want to get these two videos done, but I want a proper close uh, on this one, as, uh, of course. But uh, let me just say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for supporting this show, for supporting Matt Chad, for supporting me, uh, for buying the books, for posting reviews, you know, whatever it is you do to support the show. Look, I really, truly appreciate that, so thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you think the show is worth a buck, if you like uh, seeing Matt Chat, and for whatever reason, just haven't stepped up to the plate yet. Hey, I'm not judging you. Just uh, please, uh, when you get a moment, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, you can sign up a buck an episode. You only get charged when the episodes come out. Or you can go to matchat.us and do the same thing, basically, with PayPal. Uh, but anyway, whatever you do, just, just know that I really appreciate it, and thank you for that. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> All 
right, sir, our good old buddy, the one and only Shane Stacks from ShanePlays.com. Uh, sent a couple things in. Uh, one is System Shock 3 pre-alpha gameplay teaser from Other Side Entertainment. So check this out, see what they're doing with old Shodan. Uh, if you haven't heard of this project or haven't been tracking it, they have got uh, Warren Spector in on this. Of course, you know who he <laughs> Hopefully you know who Spector is if you're into this franchise. Uh, there's also uh, Ken's on this from Bioshock. He also led uh, System Shock 2. Uh, so I'm trying to find out, like, when is this coming out? You know, as best I can do at the moment is sometime, maybe, <laughs> next year. <laughs> but anyway, check out this footage. You know, as usual, there's a little bit of uh, controversy in the comments. You know, whether people like it or hate it or whatever. Uh, but it looks really interesting to me. Uh, secondly, we have Celasta, or Celasta, Crown of the Magisters, the new turn-based tactical CRPG. Yes, let me say those lovely words again. <laughs> a new turn-based tactical CRPG. If that doesn't get you excited, excited I don't know what will. Uh, it's made by the co-founder of the studio that brought you Endless Legend. I'm a, you know, I, I've played most of those Endless Legend games. They're really fun. Uh, let's see. By RPG fans, for RPG fans by Tactical Adventures. Uh, so that team is led by Matthew Gerard, co-founder of Amplitude Studios. So anyway, take check this out. Uh, they're going to be on Shane's show, uh, the developers on Shane Plays. And, you know, unfortunately, I'll be out of town for a while, but they have expressed interest on coming on Mad Chat. So let me know what you think. Uh, do you want me to interview those guys? You know, I think it'd be a, a really good show. All right, let's see what else. Uh, oh, this is kind of fun. This is the Game Board 1. It wants to be the, the digital slate for your tabletop board games. And as you can see, it's kind of, a, instead of playing with a piece of cardboard, you know, you got this thing with all kinds of functionality in it. They say it's all about the square shape. It's got Qualcomm off-the-shelf hardware and a transparent antenna that can be embedded in the touch screen. It can detect objects that are placed on top of it or on the sides. We know what the piece is and where it is on the board and which way it is facing. It's a really cool system. So, you know, I was talking about something like this on Twitter. I was just thinking about some uh, kind of uh, Bluetooth dice or like a dice tray. Maybe they could read your rolls. Well, I think it'd be kind of fun to play a role-playing game on the computer uh, where you actually are rolling real dice and you can see the you know results there in the tray and have it uh, just feed into the computer automatically. I think that'd be pretty awesome. So it looks like maybe this, uh, this, this might be the way to go. This digital, this uh, Game Board 1 might be uh, basically what I had in mind. Of course, the nice thing about this would be flexible enough. You could do all sorts of other kinds of games with it. Uh, so anyway, it looks really cool. I'm going to keep my eye on that. Uh, let me know what you think, too. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about design, being a designer, uh, art, invention, you know, creativity, all that good stuff. And I <laughs> found a fabulous one by Ark, or R. Buckminster Fuller. R. Buckminster Fuller. It goes something like this. A designer is an emerging synthesis of artist, inventor, mechanic, objective economist, and evolutionary strategist. So ponder on that and see you next time.
Don't give him any water to drink. And whatever you do, don't give him a bath. And probably the most important thing, don't ever feed him after midnight. <laughs>